my name is Holly, and welcome to The Murder She Shed. This is the place we discuss true crime, unique crime cases, right from my she shed. Today is about a sadistic pedophile that is truly the most disgusting case I have ever researched. I believe he may be the one of the most horrible individuals to ever have walked the earth. So, you know what is coming. A warning that this video contains some graphic discussions that may be too upsetting for some people. So, viewer discretion is advised. Wesley Allen Dodd is often a killer that is often not discussed on most YouTube channels because even for true crime, he is considered too gruesome and disturbing to talk about. Before we begin, if you are new to this channel and haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy my content. Thanks so much for joining us in the Murder She Shed. Also, I'm going to Canada for three weeks. If I'm able to make a video during that time, I will. But if not, I will see y'all in three weeks. Okay, let's get started. On September 4th, 1989, 17-year-old Danny Miller was walking home from working a shift at McDonald's when he decided to take a shortcut through a trail in a park. When suddenly, he stopped dead in his tracks because he seen a small figure in a shallow ditch covered in blood on his torso and legs. There was not movement or no response from the little boy. So Danny ran to a nearby payphone to call authorities. Danny thought the boy had gotten hit by a car and had gotten thrown into that ditch. And that's what it looked like to him. After the paramedics arrived, they realized the young boy had a weak pulse, and quickly realized it was not a hit and run. But the young boy had been viciously stabbed. On the Metaflight, the young boy passed away. And for the moment, with no way of IDing him, he became Junior Doe. Meanwhile, Claire Near, father of 11-year-old Cole and 10-year-old Billy, were late for dinner. Claire was a divorced father of three. Cole and Billy had rode their bikes over to the golf course to collect balls that people had lost in order to make some little bit of extra cash selling them. They would often do this daily, and Claire knew it was a safe neighborhood, so he didn't mind them doing that. He knew they were both good boys, and wouldn't get in any trouble. Billy was in fourth grade, and Cole was in fifth grade at Marshall Elementary School. They were both very smart boys who were really close for brothers. They usually were seen doing everything together. Cole was a real good artist for being a young child. Claire never figured out where Cole actually got that talent from. Billy was good at fixing anything. He would often take things apart and then put them back together. My youngest son did that. Model cars was his favorite thing to work on. Claire knew his boys were never late for dinner, so as it started getting dark, he called authorities and reported his boys missing. When the cops received the call, they realized there might be another boy in that park. But they did not let Claire know about the boy that was now dead that they had found. They gathered people together to go search at the park for possibly another body. First, they discovered two boys' bikes just off the trail at the park. Then around 2 a.m. that morning, they found the other brother lying among heavy brush dead. 
stabbed in the chest and abdomen with his pants pulled down to his knees. After pictures had been given to authorities of the missing boys, they quickly realized that the bodies were Cole and Billy Near. Claire Near was told and began to sob and didn't know how he could go on without his boys. I can't even imagine. Danny Miller, the 17-year-old, became a suspect and as a result would suffer from depression, nightmares, and he had trouble even finding a job due to people in the neighborhood just shunning him because they thought he was a suspect. It took weeks for Danny's names to be cleared. Wesley Allen Dodd would soon kill again. Wesley was born on July 3rd of 1961 to Jim and Carol. He was their very first child. Wesley claimed he was never abused or neglected as a child. He claimed, however, that the words, I love you, were never said to him as he grew up. Nor could he ever remember saying them. He stated that his mom and dad were always fighting and there was no love between them. Wesley was described as a loner who would often be bullied. He had two younger siblings that he claimed would often get more attention than him. On the weekend of his ninth birthday, while his siblings were getting their tonsils removed, Wesley was at his cousin's house who had another relative visiting as well. All three boys decided to go swimming, and at some point, the two boys pulled down their swimming trunks and touched each other's private parts. Although it shocked Wesley, it left a deep impression in his young head. Then after Wesley had turned 10, a neighborhood girl said she had something she wanted to show Wesley and his younger sister also. She took them into the corner of her garage and pulled down her pants, then asked Wesley to pull down his pants. I'm trying to be real careful with my words because YouTube doesn't like certain words. So, although this is a very graphic story, I'm trying to... Be careful. At 12, Dodd's friend described to him about how his stepdad had to use a catheter to urinate. Later, Wesley would begin experimenting with his body and would put stripe pens and the filler of ink pens into his privates. Wesley said that he would trick his victims by saying that he could do tricks, kind of like a sword swallower. At 14, Wesley snuck into his sister's bedroom while she was sleeping and placed her hand on his private. He then pulled down her pants and was going to, you know her, but she woke up and pushed him away. Also, at 14, Wesley played tug-of-war with his eight-year-old cousin by tying a string to each other's privates. Afterwards, Wesley R.A.P.'d his cousin. He molested his own female cousin as well in a closet and her six-year-old brother later that day. He's a sick boy. After Wesley entered junior high, he started flashing every child, boy or girl, that got off the school bus near his house. He would yell, hey, out his bedroom window, and then expose his cell. He quickly got turned in for this behavior. This is when he decided, well, it was best not to expose himself near his home. This made him think of a game to play with the young kids. He would tell them to line up with their backs to him and put their hands behind their backs and then to close their eyes so they can guess what item he had put into their hands. Then he would walk from child to child putting his junk in their hand. He would get very excited by this game. He knew that he preferred boys, but would take any child that would go along with his sick games. He would often take babysitting jobs so he could molest the children that he babysitted for. 
His parents divorced when he was around 15, and he was glad because they fought a lot. In 1979, he graduated high school and two years later entered the Navy. He was only in the Navy for two years because he was discharged due to an incident where he had approached two young boys and had attempted to entice them by giving them money. After being discharged, he moved in with his dad who lived in Idaho at the time and began molesting two boys that were friends of the family. He did some jail time for these incidents and was also attending group therapy. During this time, Wesley met a single mother of nine-year-old boy, and one Saturday morning, the boy was left with Wesley when the mother went to work. And although he told himself, because he liked the boy, he wouldn't mess with him. He ended up molesting the boy. He only ended up in four months in jail for that incident. As soon as he got out of jail, he moved into a place full of single moms and found a four-year-old boy to single out and began what Wesley called a relationship with the boy. Usually, he had molested the boy at least four times Four times a week, guys. In August of 1986, would be his youngest victim. He moved in with his sister and brother-in-law. And his brother-in-law's relatives moved in with them as well. The relative had an 18-month-old little boy. 18 months. And he ended up babysitting this baby. He couldn't even speak yet. And he was forced into unspeakable acts of torture involving bondage. Eventually, the actual R-A-P-E would not be enough for him, and he started keeping a diary where he would fantasize about murder. In his diaries, he would write all the gruesome acts he would perform on boys. He kept the diary along with pictures in a briefcase. This is the actual suitcase or briefcase. That he carried. In 1987, Wesley chose the first child he would murder. It would be an eight-year-old boy he met while working as a security guard for a construction site. On this day, off he drove to where the boy lived, hoping to lure him into one of the vacant buildings nearby. Then he planned to take the child into an isolated wooded area where he would kill him. But the kid sensed that his new friend was dangerous after Dodd asked him to help find a lost little boy. The eight-year-old said that he was going to go home to get some toys for the lost boy and promised that he'd be right back. Instead, he stayed inside and his mother called the police. That was a smart little boy. He only served another short sentence. After serving that short sentence, he then moved to a new apartment near a park called David Douglas Park and decided this would be his new hunting grounds. He gathered his hunting gear, which included a fish fillet knife bandaged to his ankle and shoestrings to tie up his victims. This is when he would encounter Cole and Billy Near in his first known murders would occur. The boys were riding down the trail on their bikes, returning home from that golf park we talked about. When they encountered Wesley, who stepped into the middle of the trail, blocking their path home. Wesley told them he wanted them to come with him. It is assumed they thought he may have just needed help with something. So they got off and followed him. When they got into the thicker woods of the park, Wesley told them to pull down their pants. He told them he wouldn't let them go until they did. Billy pointed at his brother and said, him. And Cole said, why? And Wesley said, because I told you to. So Cole, too scared not to obey, did as he was told. And Wesley performed O-R-A-L on him. He preferred Billy, but every time he attempted anything with Billy, Billy would just cry really loudly. 
so he just gave up. After having Cole turn around, Cole said, Will it hurt? And Wesley said, No. He then made an attempt to molest the boy, but had problems, well, performing. So at this point, he just became frustrated and pulled out his knife and stabbed little Billy in the abdomen. And then he turned towards Cole and stabbed him three times. While he was doing this, Billy began to run and beg for his life. He caught up with him when Billy started saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This would later haunt Wesley, or so he said. He was about to kill the boy, yet Billy was tearfully apologizing to him. He then stabbed him multiple times. Suddenly, the lives of two young boys were taken by a monster, and the monster knew right then that he would kill again because it pleased and excited him more than the other encounters ever had. Next time, though, he wanted to be able to get his victim to his house so he could keep him for a while before killing him. He started writing about his killings in a diary so he could relive them again and again. He would also write different ways he wanted to kill his victims in the future. Wesley now fantasized about the experimental surgeries he wanted to perform on his victims. They were horrible, and he wanted to perform it while they were awake. And it involved the privates. Yeah. He also wrote how he would like to try eating their privates. He also stated dead children would be a cheap way to feed my slaves if I ever had any. Referring to the children, he would keep and use as his assistants. He also spent this time building a torture rack in which to restrain his victims on. Then on October, he decided he could not wait anymore for his next victim. He drove to Portland, Oregon and found a park to sit and wait for a potential victim. In his diary, he called his victims targets or referred to them as it. On Sunday, October 29th, Justin and his little brother Lee told their father that they were going to the school ground park along with another friend. It was a sunny day, and their father, Robert Zelli, thought it would be okay. The boys had been there a couple of times before. He told his sons to stay together and to watch out for strangers. The neighborhood was safe, but he warned his children to be careful. That same morning, Wesley drove to the Richmond School playground and waited. He noticed some older kids were playing football. Wesley spotted four-year-old Lee by himself playing atop a concrete structure with a slide that the kids called the volcano. After a bit, the little boy slid down to the base. Wesley approached him and smiled. Hi, how are you doing? Lee smiled back and said, Hi, would you like to have some fun and make some money? He asked Lee. The boy seemed frightened and hesitated, looking around and then shook his head. No. This is little Simon coming. Sorry if you can hear Simon breathing. But Wesley insisted and offered his hand. Lee, perhaps in an automatic response, took his hand. Wesley led the blonde, blue-eyed child to his car, then Lee started to resist. I don't want any money, Lee said, sensing his fear. Wesley tried to assure Lee that it'd be okay. His dad had sent him to get the boy, he said. When Wesley placed Lee in his car and drove off, the boy said, I'll live the other way. We're going to my house and play some games, said Wesley. Just do what I tell you, and I promise I won't hurt you. But you'll have to be quiet when we get there. My landlord doesn't like little kids. Lee worried that his brother was going to miss him. But Wesley soothed him, saying that they would have fun, and his brothers were having fun too. Unfortunately for Lee, he was a sweet, beautiful baby that had never 
seen a stranger. And just like any four-year-old, he didn't know that there was evil people in this world. He would soon find out differently. It was 1.30 p.m. when they arrived at Wesley's apartment. Both the landlord and the other tenants were gone. It was perfect, almost too good to be true, Wesley observed. He picked up Lee and started to carry him from the car. But the boy protested. I can walk, said Lee. He put Lee down and Lee, in his innocence, followed Wesley into his apartment. Shortly after entering his apartment with Lee, Wesley set the child down on his bed and took his photograph with the Polaroid camera, according to the entries he made in his diary. He then brought out his briefcase from beneath the bed, unlocked and opened it, and took out his pink photo album labeled Family Memories. As they sat next to Lee on the bed, Wesley thumbed through the nude photos for the boy's benefit. Lee, however, exhibited an only mild interest in the pictures. After putting away the photo album, Wesley, speaking in a calm, quiet voice, instructed Lee to take off his clothes. Lee seemed to ignore him, and he repeated the instructions while pulling off one of Lee's shoes. Wesley sensed a little resistance, but removed Lee's other shoe and both of his socks, after which Lee pulled off his jacket and shirt. Wesley continued to coast the child to take off the rest of his clothes, and Lee pulled off his pants and Ghostbusters underpants in the same movement. Wesley immediately had Lee lay on his back on the bed and securely fastened the ropes, which he had pre-attached to each corner of the bed, to Lee's ankles and wrists. He then snapped the second photo and released Lee from the restraints. Wesley removed his clothes too, and for the next hour, proceeded to molest little Lee. Afterward, he allowed Lee to dress and wrote that Lee's happy and cheerful. Yeah, whatever. Together, they watched Yogi Bear cartoons on television, after which Wesley placed the two photos of Lee inside of his photo album. He said, do you want to spend the night with me? The little boy said, no, my brother might miss me. No, your brother is probably having fun too, said Wesley. Wesley sat quietly and thought for a few moments and then added, I'm sorry I don't have any toys for you to play with. Would you like to go to Kmart? I'll buy you a He-Man or a Robocop toy. And then we can go to McDonald's for a burger if you'll spend the night with me. It was just too much for little Lee or any child to resist. He agreed. While at Kmart, Lee did the unexpected. He began thinking about his dad and brother again and started crying. As Wesley attempted to calm him down, he kept saying that he wanted to go home. At one point, Lee's pleas caught the attention of a store employee. And Wesley calmly explained that he was caring for his sister's child, who wanted to go home but couldn't, not just yet anyway. His explanation seemed to satisfy the store employee, after which Wesley selected and paid for a Robocop toy. The toy helped calm Lee down, and they ate hamburgers together at McDonald's. Afterward, Wesley allowed Lee a few minutes to even play on the playground. They were back inside Wesley's apartment by 6.30 p.m., and Lee continued to play with his new toy. Wesley, meanwhile, had already begun making plans to kill the boy. He suspects nothing now, he wrote in his diary. We'll probably wait until morning to kill him. That way his body will still be fairly fresh for experiments afterward. I'll suffocate him in his sleep when I wake up for work, if I sleep. Dodd didn't sleep at all that night. He was just too excited, overwhelmed by actually having a child inside his apartment. It was what he had been dreaming of and living for, and now it was a reality. And it had all been so very easy. Wesley molested Lee throughout the night as he slept. Then around 5.30 that morning, he would choke and revive him two or three times before getting a rope and tying the rope to a bar in his closet and hanging him until he was sure the boy was dead. Then he took the body down and attempted necro, you know the word. 
After work, he then put the body in a trash bag and dumped his body in a game preserve where a hunter would later find Lee's little body. Fortunately, Wesley's next attempt at taking a victim would be his final attempt. Wesley went to the movie theater during a showing of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids for his final victim. He attempted to abduct six-year-old James from the restroom of this theater. The child began fighting and crying as Wesley was leaving the theater through the lobby, carrying the boy in his arms. Despite his attempts to calm the boy, theater employees became suspicious and followed Wesley out to the street. Due to their pursuit, Wesley released his victim, got into his car, and drove away. The boyfriend of the boy's mother, William Ray Graves, came to the theater lobby and was told that the boy had nearly been abducted. Graves went outside the theater in the direction where Wesley was last seen. Wesley's car had broken down a short distance away from the theater, thank God. And he was attempting to start the motor in order not to raise Wesley's suspicions and to stall for time. Graves pretended to be a passerby and offered to help him. You know how hard that would have been? (laughs) He then put Wesley into a headlock and returned him to the theater where employees called the police. Thanks to this brave man, Wesley would never hurt or kill another child. Less than four years elapsed between the murder and Wesley Allen Dobbs' execution. He refused to appeal his case or the capital sentence. He insisted that he could not control his urges and would kill again. There are excerpts of Wesley's diary online, but they are extremely graphic and disgusting. I did not even read, but like a few entries. It was just more than I could handle. I believe he was one of the most vile, disgusting individuals ever. I'm going to end my video with a small clip of Wesley being interviewed. But first I will tell you guys bye. Love y'all and thanks for joining me in the murder she shed. And I will see y'all, if not sooner, in three weeks. All right? Love y'all. Here's the clip. Bye. Why do you want to be executed? Uh, I have to be. Uh, if I will kill again. No, I would do it again. I've been molesting kids nonstop since I was 13 years old, over half my life. Uh, anything happened, I can guarantee I'd do it again, and sooner or later I would kill another child. I've done it before, and at the time I liked it. God also says that if he ever escapes from prison, there is someone in particular well, that he will be out to kill. I'm not going to say who, but there is somebody out there. There's a man out there. There's a man? Yeah. Someone related to the case that got you in prison in the first place? Mm, not directly, no. But it's something that you know that you're going to do or you, you plan to do, you want to do. Yeah. You shouldn't do any good? I think it would. I think a few child molesters, anyway, are going to think twice before they do anything again. How do you live with yourself daily? At times, it's not easy. Uh, I said there's times I think about what I've done. Um, I think about some of the things the boys said before they died, and and that's real hard to think about. Um, At other times, I just try to put everything out of my mind. Do you look forward to dying? In a way, yeah, I think it'd be a relief. I don't have to think about all these things anymore. Uh, and I know that's the only way I can guarantee I'm not going to hurt anybody else. Um, you know, right now, I sit here and say I don't want to, but I know it'll happen.